Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath and for the opportunity we have to study together. We invite your spirit to speak to our hearts, uh, to correct our thinking and understanding, and to pro provide light for our path, for our feet. And we ask for strength to walk in that light. I pray that you can be with each person in this study, that you can speak to each person, the need, speak to the need that each of us have. And um, we also ask that you can be with this movement and with the light that's been shining upon us, um, help us to clearly discern it. We pray for one another. Be with us now and guide in this study. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, happy Sabbath. It's nice to see everyone here this evening. Now, this study is going to take a couple of weeks. Um, so this Friday and next Friday. And what you see in front of you is, is um, part of what we need to look at. But where I want to start first is in a paper. It's entitled The Three Constantines. And this paper was put out by Tabo um, back in 2017. I don't know how many people read this or remember his studies back then, um, but it's just part of this paper. So there's actually another paper that goes into this in much more detail. But this one does a summary of that study that he was doing back then regarding uh, the first seven Roman emperors or the first seven Caesars. So he says, another witness is the seven thunders of the seven the Caesars. In this line of prophecy, Julius Caesar marks the death of the Roman Republic. Now, when he's talking here about this, I'm just going to go back maybe a little bit, just so you can see what the context is. This has to do with the Sunday law. So he's talking about the Sunday law in the United States, and he's going to use these first seven Caesars as we were using in the past with the the seven kings of Judah, the seven kings of Israel, etc., cetera, um, to understand the Sunday law. So he says, another witness is the seven thunders of the seven Caesars. So this is a witness to the Sunday law on how we believe it's going to come in the United States. In this line of prophecy, Julius Caesar marks the death of the Roman Republic. He he and is located in 1989, it just probably he is located in 1989, when the United States took the first step towards its death as the sixth kingdom, kingdom of Bible prophecy. The step taken was uh, its coming into union with the papacy. So the idea is that in 1989, the United States comes in union with the papacy. Julius Caesar was followed by Augustus, in whose reign the shepherds and the wise men received an increase of knowledge on the birth of the Messiah. Now, if we're going to look at the time of the end in the time of Christ, where would we put the time of the end? Would we put it in the time of Julius Caesar or in the time of Augustus? Many have said in the time of Augustus. Yeah, so Christ is born, and of course, John the Baptist, in the time of Augustus. And so that's where we mark the time of the end. But here they're going to take this line of the Caesars, and they're going to put the time of the end in the time of Julius Caesar, who dies in, what, 44 or something. So he dies quite a long time before Christ is born, 40 years before. Um. Uh, this typifies the increase of knowledge that followed the time of the end. This is marked in 1992 when Jeff Pippinger came to understand Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. Augustus was followed by Tiberius. John the Baptist ministered in his reign. John formalized the message that Christ later bore in the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. 
This typifies the formalization of the message in 1996 through the publication of the Time of the End magazine. So you can see how he's lining this up with our line and, and taking um, Julius Caesar, Augustus, and then Tiberius is basically the arrival, the formalization, and um, uh, going through this, this history. So it's this increase of light, I guess, then the formalization being Tiberius. Uh, Tiberius was followed by Caligula, whose mismanagement of the empire led to f a financial crisis and famine. This typifies 9-11, where we would look at that as the empowerment of the first angel's message, where radical Islam entered the stage of history and began to do its work of breaking the world economy. Caligula was followed by Claudius, who passed a persecutorial decree against the Christians in Rome. His decree saw Priscilla and Aquila being deported from the city and typifies developments at midnight, which marked the beginning of the persecution of the priests. Nero followed Claudius and is located at the midnight cry. The city of Rome burnt down in the time of Nero. Now, we're gonna look at this in a lot more detail, uh, the significance of this. But in this study in 2017, before we have November 9th and before we have July 18th, this fire is being mentioned and this fire happens on july 18th um, so it's a, a fire that is a symbol or attached to the symbol that we that we used for our prediction which we would call the battle of paneum which is dealing with the midnight cry so we'll come back to this um, the city was the empire's sanctuary of strength the source of its power this typifies the burning of the U.S. Constitution, which takes place from the midnight cry to the Sunday law, when that constitution is repudiated. Nero died in 66 AD, and his death was followed by a period of civil war known as the year of the four emperors, where Galba, Otho, Vitellius, and Vespasian succeeded each other to the throne. So this, in the year 69 AD, you actually have four different emperors that, it, that uh, are on the throne that year. And then Vespasian, he, he maintains the power for 10 years, but his reign starts in 69. The number of four represents a scattering and is identifying the scattering of the United States as the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. Vespasian's son was Titus, the famous general who burnt down Jerusalem and scattered the Jews in 70 AD. So you're going to see that Titus's army destroys Jerusalem in 70 AD under Vespasian's reign. Uh, Titus becomes the emperor in 79. So he's emperor from 79 to 81. So he's just the general. He's the son of Vespasian who, who um, burns down the temple. Vespasian, therefore, marks the Sunday law where Adventism is besieged and burnt down. The year of the four emperors, which began at the midnight cry can thus be understood to be showing that there will be a civil war in America at the midnight cry image of the beast. So, so this sums up a whole study, but it sums it up quite well. And, and th it's this study that um, we're going to see was here. Um, so we're going to go to these are Odilio's notes. Now we did go through Odilio's study did, with Odilio here on Sunday afternoons uh, back a while ago. And um, I think we did three studies, if I remember correctly. Now this was a, um, the, we had some differences. I had some differences with Odilio regarding the inside job and some of his conclusions um, regarding 9-11, but it was an important study in that there's a bunch of things that he notices that we need to draw our attention to. Now, hopefully people can see this fairly well. I know some people have devices that are tiny, but I'll try to get it as big as I can. So he says, on August 15th, 2020, an old study was posted on the FFA chat that incidentally resurfaced weeks after the July 18 disappointment. 
This was a study presented by Tavo, by written, but written by Brother Blessing, in Italy in 2017, which was dealing with the seven thunders being paralleled with the first seven Caesars of Rome. But this comment on the chat went largely unnoticed. So I'd like to bring your attention again that this study about the seven Caesars was presented in Italy in 2017, one year before the issue of time setting was raised by Parminder and also before Tess came into the picture. So you can see the significance of this, especially as we go into the study, that uh, what happens with the first seven Caesars of Rome is there's going to be things that are noticed in this study that at the time would have no significance to those looking at this. So in 2017, a lot of these things aren't going to have any meaning to anyone until uh, we get into 2018. So a year before, a year and a half before a lot of it. So in this line, it's just what he had uh, Tabo or was really blessing study on the three Constantines. But that summation, you can see Julius Caesar, the time of the end, Augustus is the increase of knowledge. Tiberius is the formalization. And, and I don't know why they have 1992. I would have put 1993 as the increase of knowledge, but anyway, it's just a minor point. Um, Caligula is 9-11. Clodius is, the, is midnight. Nero is the midnight cry, and Galba is the Sunday law. So fairly straightforward. Any, any questions on this part of the study of what we see here or comments? What mark? What marks uh, Galboa as uh, the Sunday law? Well, that's what a good question. Him? So one is it's gonna see, and that's where I would. That's what we're gonna look at, uh, because you're gonna see Galba, Otho, uh, Vitellius, and then um, Vespasian all are going to, uh, in that same year in sixty nine. They're all going to be emperor. So Galba starts in in 68, but in the he's not, he's only, I think, six months or something um, that he's he's emperor. And and we're gonna look at 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 we're gonna look at Revelation chapter 12. So we're gonna try to see how this relates to Revelation chapter 12. Now, if if you remember the study last week where we looked at um, the study of the seven popes. We have this idea where we take Revelation 17, five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. And we can see that um, Colin is, is presenting that idea relating to the presidents of the United States. And of course, if we can do that with the presidents of the United States, we should be able to do it with the Caesars. Um, and, and I'm suggesting that in doing it with the popes, that there is something there that's correct. And, and that we have to figure out what it is. But there's also something wrong. That is, in all of these studies, there are things that are correct. But there's something that we're missing. That, that's kind of the point that I'm making. And that point, the thing that we're missing, has to do with Revelation 12, 13, and 17. That is... We have a partial understanding of the beast that has seven heads and ten horns, but we don't have a complete understanding of it. And so we need to recognize what is what is wrong with our understanding. Our understanding is essentially correct, but it's more information that we don't have and, and maybe some misinformation, some things that we assume that aren't correct. So, um, so we're going to look at that Galba. Why Galba? So, in in the context here, it's just he's the seventh, more than anything. Not so much what happens with Galba, other than that there is, in that period of time, there is the the year of the four emperors, and the number four represents this scattering. So that's why he's he's taking that four and relating it to the Sunday law. Okay, so he's going to deal with uh, Claudius. So in the diagram, we can see that Claudius is connected with midnight. 
the study then mentions an event from the French Revolution and connects this to Claudius and to midnight. So what is the event in the French, French Revolution? He, he doesn't say here. And anybody know? And, and, and I was trying to find the study and I couldn't find the study he's referring to. And I don't know why, because I thought I had it, but I just probably don't know the title. Okay, what's the event in the French Revolution that we would mark as midnight? And that's connected to the symbol of November 9th. It, it sort of talks about here, this event concerns a probationary period starting from November 9th until January 1st, 1792. So this must be January or November 9th, 1791. Is that what he's saying? Anybody? I don't know if that's what he's saying because it's not clear here. Anybody familiar with that study? So I guess I can't find anything on it. Um, this one, I, I was trying to find it here before the study, but I couldn't find anything. Now, the only thing that we would have is the coup of the 18th and the 19th of Brumaire. So that's actually 1799, though. So that's the only date I have which is, of course, much later. So later. Yeah. What about the banning of the Bible or the expulsion of the Jesuits? OK, but we don't have that attached to November 9th. So I just it's the only thing. Yeah. Well, that's November 9th 17, to 10th, 1799. Well, yeah, that was uh, November 10th, 1799. Seven, the, the Bible was banned, 1793, November okay, 10th, not, for three and a half years. On November, November 10th? Yeah. The, okay. So maybe that's what he's referring to. Um, so I just don't know, because he doesn't say. Um, and that was 1793, though, you're saying. So that still wouldn't yeah, fit. Yeah, it was, yeah. Okay, no. so he said that there's a probationary period starting from November 9th until January 1st, 1792. Those are the only dates being mentioned in the entire study. So I don't know what that marks that probationary period and whether it's 1791 or 1790 or what, what the year is. But he says in that study, those are the two dates being mentioned. Now, it's January well, 1st. Well, he talks about a probationary period. Would that yeah. be three and a half, three, like 42 months? Because if he says it ends in 19, in 1792. Yeah, well, that would be three and a half. If you go like from November 9th, that wouldn't be three and a half years, though. Well, from 18, 1789, it would be. Yeah, but but we and. Oh, yeah. You know, right, two months. Well, depending or, on when. When the bread the bread revolution was when the women marched on the palace of Versailles. Yeah. So if somebody could try to find out what date he's referring to, when this probationary mm -hmm. period starts, um, that'd be interesting to find out. But I, I couldn't find it. So, but it is remarkable that we already see November nine here being connected to midnight. So that is this this study is going to connect Claudius to this probationary period of starting on November 9th to January 1st, 1792. So this is before we have connected midnight 
or raffia to November 9th, 2019. Okay, in a completely unrelated study. So that's the, the point that he's making. So um, he's just lined up here, our line 9-11, November 9th, July 18th, and the Sunday law as being how we understand this in our history with the Millerite history of the first day of the first month and the fifth day of the fourth month and the first day of the fifth month and the 10th day of the seventh month. So this is well understood. Now he's going to say that this is the priests, the Millerites, and then the biblical date he just gives at the bottom. So if anybody has questions or any thoughts, definitely feel free to, to share them. Okay, within the movement, we attributed a close of probation to November 9th in relation to the Omega movement. And remarkably, this period from November 9th to January 1st, which took place during the French Revolution, was also a probational period during which time French refugees had opportunity to return to France to, or be sentenced to death. So he gives us here um, this decree. Uh, so I'm just gonna see what this link connects us to. Um, sometimes they're not always valid links anymore. So uh, November 9th, 1791, the Legislative Assembly issued this decree against the French emigres who were mobilizing counter-revolutionary forces elsewhere in Europe. So, so that's what he's talking about. This date is November 9th, 1791. And it's this uh, declaration of the legislative assembly or decree. Um, yeah, so I'm not gonna read the decree. It's fairly long, okay. Now he says on the top of this, the number of days between November 9th and January 1st is exactly 54 days. So he's including November 9th and January 1st. The number 54, of course, is being a symbol of the fifth day of the fourth month or July, which we call midnight. And then he says also the reign of Claudius ended when he died in the year 54 the age of 63. Again, we here recognize 54 as the symbol for midnight. And moreover, he died on October 13, which was the very date in 2018 when the date for midnight was confirmed to be November 9th, 2019. And if that was not sufficient, the day that Claudius died was the biblical date, the 21st day of the seventh month, or 21-7, or July 21, again, typifying midnight. So we have all of these coincidences, which we know aren't coincidences, that show us there's something in this history. At which point Emperor Nero takes over, who in this study of the seven thunders is subsequently being positioned on the midnight cry waymark. And then we have the great fire of Rome. No particular date is being referred to in the 2017 study in connection with Nero, but the study does explicitly mention the well-known and famous historical event of Nero burning down the city of Rome during his reign in the year 64 AD. And if we then look up the date of this event in the history books, it is astounding to find that this event took place on the night of July 18. So the very day that Rome burned is apparently the very day that we predicted Nashville to burn and which we labeled as the midnight cry. So he's going to deal with Nero's reign. On top of that, it has been recorded that Nero reigned from October 13, 54 AD until June 9, 68 AD. And don't these dates look familiar to us? These are the very dates that led up to the proclamation of the midnight cry for the priests on October 13, 2018. So, and remember this 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 uh, line here, this Italian camp meeting, that on the June nine date. So this June nine date is 126 days before October 13th, and that is October 13th is the day that um, Nero is um, 
made uh, Caesar. He becomes Caesar on October 13th, and his reign ends on June 9th. So you can see this is an inversion of these dates that happened in 2018. So the October 13 and the June 9 being attached to it. And it's this June 9 date that is used to, to give us this October 13th date, 126 days. And then on October 13th, as I'm sitting in Lambert Church, I calculate 391 and a half days to midnight, November 9th, from noon, October 13th. And so this brings us to Raphia, November 9th, 2019, and Paneum, July 18, 2020. So we can see all of this, and we can then see that Nero has to be this symbol of the midnight cry if we're going to line up these seven thunders. I think the argument is extremely sound. There's no way that we can just dismiss this. Now, he also says that Nero, Nero is this, named... Is this, what's is, this that? Odilio's, is this Odilio's paper? Yeah, this is Odilio's paper. I sent it to everyone. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so then Odilio points out that there is a city that Nero named after himself, and only one city, and that is the city of Neronius. And that was the name that he gave to the city of Paneum. So again, in a, an amazing coincidence of, of how Paneum is going to be named Neronius from 61 to 68 AD for a period of seven years. Right. Um, now, can you rip it here? Um, then we have um, this is going to be named by King Agrippa. He's going to name the city Neronius. So he says, by, but so far, all of the above information just went completely unheeded by our movement. So is all this just mere coincidence? Or is this not the very same voice that spoke to us during the July 18 study? And if so, is the Lord trying to tell us something important here? Obviously, we must ask the question, what significance all of the above information has for us today? Now, he's then going to look into the inside job of 9-11, and I'm not going to address that part of his paper again, because we went through it extensively. And, you know, because we know that 9-11 is not an inside job. There's no evidence for it. It's, it's a conspiracy theory that has no grounding in fact. It only has a grounding in speculation. And, and it could even be true to some degree, even though um, we know that Ellen White seems to say that Nero did burn down the city. He definitely had some connection with what happened. But that doesn't really, it doesn't mean that we can take uh, Nero, connect him to July 18th as a conspiracy theory, and then try to line it up with 9-11 being a conspiracy theory. There's, there's no ground for that. But what we're going to look at is we're going to look at these Caesars. So I'm going to switch here to back to the thing you saw when you first came on. Um, so this is my uh, PowerPoint. I'm going to try to make this a bit bigger for people, make this smaller, make that bigger. That's too big. That's a bit better. Um, you can kind of see it here. I'm just going to move this over a bit. Okay, so when we look at, uh, this is still too big. We're going to have to, there's no middle ground here, I guess. Unfortunately, we're going to have to stick with that size. So you might not be able to see it on your device, all the, the, the writing. But what we have here is. I can see well, it. I can see it. Yeah, well, you're looking on an iPhone? Yeah, I can see it pretty good. Or a Galaxy S7. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, you can see it. Okay, that's good. Now, what I want to do is I want to address 
Revelation chapter 12. So 12, 13, and 17, as we know, these are, this is the beast that has seven heads and ten horns. But we know it's not the same beast. Um, our position is that the beast in Revelation 12 is pagan Rome. The beast in Revelation 13 is papal Rome. And the beast in Revelation 17 is modern Rome. Now, they all have seven heads and ten horns. And we definitely know that the horns are not the same. In, in Revelation 13, the horns all have crowns. In Revelation 17, they don't have crowns, and they represent the United Nations. In Revelation 13, the horns represent divided Europe, right? So, they, so they're not the same beasts. Even though they have similarities, they have differences. They have differences of when they're located and what they, what they completely represent. We know in Revelation 13, it's a composite beast, and definitely you can see the characteristics of Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome in that beast. But it's papal Rome that's being represented with those characteristics. In Revelation 17, we have the woman riding the beast. The woman is Babylon, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. That's the papacy. And she's riding this beast. So she has to be distinguished from the beast itself. That is, the beast represents the civil power, and the woman riding the beast represents the church. And it's this connection of church and state, um, which uh, we're going to look at. So the question is, in Revelation chapter 12, what are the seven heads and what are the ten horns? Anybody know? Okay, what would the ten horns be in Revelation 12? Could they be divided Europe? Yeah, sure. Okay, okay how so? How could the Revelation 12 being pagan Rome, he, how could the ten kings? Well the, well, the dragon, the dragon is pagan Rome. Right. So the dragon's pagan Rome, and it has seven heads and ten horns. So, and 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 the ones that have the crowns are not the horns, but the heads. And so the ten horns. The question is, what are the ten horns? Since Europe hasn't been divided in the time of pagan Rome though it is going to be divided near the end of that period. So maybe we can argue that. Um, but could the ten horns represent something else? Hey, Jeff, remember, turn off your mic when you're not speaking. It's pretty noisy. Okay. So could the ten horns represent something other than a divided Roman Empire? Or, or do they represent that still? What would be the arguments we would have for that? Ten horns representing ten governing districts of the world. Okay. So, well, the way that the pioneers looked at it, this had to do with the different forms of government, right? The seven heads and the ten horns had to do with forms of government. That was their argument. And we know that the number 10 usually refers to some kind of universality. Okay, so. So if we, if we're looking at these, if we're looking at the time of Christ, because remember this, this beast is primarily Satan but also represents pagan Rome, according to Ellen White. And it's going to be at the time of Christ. So wouldn't it have to have seven heads and ten horns in connection with this period of time? Not necessarily when Jesus is born, but in this period of time that's being addressed, which is the period of time from the birth of Christ 
up until uh, the woman fleeing into the wilderness, which is going to be 538. So you would say that this represents pagan Rome from that period, from the time of Christ to 538. So Christ's birth, the time of Augustus. Okay, well, let's, let's look. I mean, you're looking at my chart there, but let's look at the scripture itself. So it says, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. So we already looked at this as a, a representation of the sky. That is, we could see that this is representing um, the constellation, dealing with the Virgin, and you're going to have the moon under her feet. That means it's a new moon, because that only happens when she's clothed with the sun and you have a new moon. That you can't, She can't be clothed with the sun and have the moon under her feet during a full moon. It can only be during a new moon. And then she's going to have 12 stars. Normally there's nine stars above her head. And so we saw that 777 days before November 9th, there was a prediction made based on Revelation 12, saying that the 1260 years or 1260 days, the three and a half years, were going to begin. That it depended on the religious beliefs of the people who, who believe that. Some would say that's going to be when they thought that that was going to be. And that's, of course, um, going to be uh, um, the date is September 23rd, 2017. That's 777 days before November 9th, 2019. And so it would either be like the, the secret rapture or something would happen. Of course, nothing happened on that date. But it's significant that a prediction was made using this prophe prophecy for a date that was 777 days before November 9th, however one wants to understand that. But when we look at this prophecy, it's referring to the time of Christ, and that we can all agree on, that it's any application of it to the future is, is an application. It's not, a, it's, we never would say that this is what this prophecy is primarily speaking of. Now, when this occurs, there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman, the one who gave birth to this child, the church, Israel, flees into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And any thoughts on what we see here? When we're dealing with pagan Rome, what is what would the seven heads and ten horns have to be? this is not the world empires that are being spoken of here. Any thoughts by anyone? I got a lot of thoughts, but. Okay. About now, it, if we... about it. Okay, go on. Yeah, any, can you say any of these thoughts? What do you think it might be? Yeah, ten crowns and seven heads, right? Well, there's seven crowns. Yeah. There's, there's oh, seven. Crowns. Oh, seven, so, okay. Yeah, so because they, they, yeah, doesn't say anything about ten crowns. It just says the seven heads have crowns. Right? Okay, yeah, right, right, just crowns. Right. So the crowns are upon the heads of... Now, I have seen some people try to put ten crowns on the heads of the... Uh, of the the seven of the beast, but yeah, I've heard that too. But it doesn't say it has. It said well, it says seven crowns upon its heads. 
So that means there's seven heads and seven crowns and ten horns. Well, three yeah. three were uprooted. Um, three horns are uprooted. You have seven left. Okay. Yeah, but but this can't be talking about the the nations of divided Europe, or at least I'm suggesting that it's not referring to that. That the ten the ten horns here are referring to pagan Rome. The ten the ten horns of the beast of Revelation thirteen are not referring to pagan Rome. They're, refer, they're referring to the nations that bring about the end of pagan Rome. Could we say that these ten horns are ten Caesars? Did you have to remember your, your mic there? Could we say these ten horns are ten Caesars? Does that make sense? It would seem to, that could line up. Okay. Now we know in, in the study that, that um, Odilio did, he has seven, seven Caesars. Could the, could the seven horns represent seven Caesars as well? Or the seven heads, I mean, represent seven Caesars. Could they represent Julius, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, and one of those last four? Yeah, sure. Okay. Now, so if there's seven heads but ten horns, what would that mean? So if, if they all represent Caesars, what would we what would we conclude about the seven heads and the ten horns? Anyone got any ideas? Now, now up in the top, I have uh, 10 counted from Augustus. So this is just me sort of working through things. So you can kind of ignore that one. Um, because this would more line up with what Odilio has done. Because he has Julius Augustus, Tiberius Caligula, Claudius. And, and he would say those are five are fallen. Nero, the one is. And the one that's still to come he will continue a short space and then and you would have the eighth if we're going to apply that riddle that um both um can't think of his name now the guy from last week um what was his name myers myers was his last name um I know what you mean. Yeah, okay. So Meyer studies on the popes. He was applying the riddle of Revelation 17 to the popes. And then we also um, have Colin applying them to the presidents of the United States. Ralph Myers. Ralph Myers, thank yes, you. thank you. And then we have here, even though Odilio's not applying it in that way, he sort of is, right? If, if you look at it, because if you're going to take these, these Caesars and you're going to line up them up with the presidents of the United States, you would have to, right? Because that's what we're doing, even though they're not quite doing it that way in Tabo study. So some, some differences here. But you could see, you would say, five are fallen, Julius Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius. One is, that's Nero. Now what, and I know I'm asking you guys a lot of questions and I'm not getting much answers back, but what would be, is there any reason we could apply the riddle of Revelation 17 to the emperors of Rome? Yeah, no, we didn't we apply the popes, talked about the popes last week. 
Yeah, so we looked at the popes, and, 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 and Colin has addressed that with the presidents of the United States, and now we're going to look at it in connection with the Caesars of Rome. So the question is, is there a justification to apply that riddle of Revelation 17 to the beast of Revelation 12? Yeah, so Iran is noting that the eighth is a threefold power, and seven plus three is ten. So, so we can try to say that this has something to do with it. In in that, his argument is saying that we can. Because this this is an important point. If we're going to to apply, so the riddle, the riddle states that uh, the eight is of the seven. Okay, we need to understand what that means too. Um, so let's look to, at Revelation 17 again. Now, I, I have an opinion that we've missed something in Revelation 17. That is, we've made a, ma a mistake in our interpretation of Revelation 17. Not a major mistake in the sense that, I mean, it's major in some ways, but it's like we essentially understand it. But the problem is the eighth. So let's go back and look at this. Um, so we know that this, this great horse, she's going to commit fornication with the inhabitants of the earth, right? So he carried me away, verse 3, in the spirit, into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So when it, we're brought into the wilderness, doesn't this bring us to the period of 1260 years? Yeah, I would say yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and so we understand that, that this is 1798. I would say so. Yeah. And now it's going to be a scarlet colored beast, not a great red dragon, but, you know, red and scarlet are kind of similar, but however that is. But this woman is riding this beast. So it's not the beast of Revelation 13 because the beast of Revelation 13 is the papacy. We now see this woman riding this beast. So there's something that's different. Um, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So we know that this woman is the papacy that has persecuted God's people for 1260 years. And the beast, the beast is scarlet colored too. Yeah. So it's a, a monarchy of kings. Yes, it could be a monarchy of kings. Um, they both have scarlet, scarlet yeah. color. Yeah, well, and monarchy can well, offer- does it tie in with does the monarchy tie in with where the uh, saints were martyred, um, which I guess would have been in Italy? And well, obviously, yeah, they, well, the they were, papacy had the blessing of government or the king. The king. Yeah. So the papacy uses the the civil power to do its persecution, but in Revelation thirteen, the woman isn't yeah. separate from the beast. In Revelation seventeen, she is. And then it says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, etc. And then the angel said unto me, Wherefore still thou marvel? And I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. Now, one of the things we see about this one is there's no crowns upon the horns or the heads, as there is in Revelation 12. There's seven crowns on the seven heads. In Revelation 13, there's ten crowns. On the ten horns. Could that represent them giving their kingdom to the beast for one hour by not having crowns? Well, that's going to refer to the fact that they're going to reign one hour with the beast. So, so they haven't been any given any kingdom as of yet. Isn't that the same thing he's saying, though? Okay. Yeah. That's right. with the beast. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so um, so the woman's riding this beast, and it says the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is and then we're going to be asked to use um wisdom right here is the mind which hath wisdom now we know that same sort of idea is connected with counting the number of the beast that you have to have this wisdom and it says the seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth and there are seven kings five are fallen and one is and the other is not yet come and when he cometh he must continue a short space and the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition so one of the things about this does it say that the eighth is one of the heads no okay so it doesn't and it actually quite kind of makes a distinction here because there are actually only seven heads there's not eight except that there is an eighth, but that eighth is the beast itself. And he's of the seventh, yeah. He's of the seven. Now, so the question is, what is the eighth? Now, we would say that the eighth is the papacy because the papacy received a deadly wound. It's one of the heads that was wounded unto death. But we can see this isn't the same beast as in Revelation 13. It's a different beast. And so when he comes again, when he cometh, when the beast comes again, he must continue a short space. So this beast is what? What is the beast that the woman's riding? Anybody have any suggestion? Sorry, this is a stupid question, okay. but um, I don't have my Bible. I'm, I'm in a different room <clears throat> and uh, your screen doesn't go back far enough. The beast that the woman is riding, well, <clears throat> what kingdom are we in here? Okay, well, we say this, this is, is like during the 1260. No, it was not during the 1260s. So this okay, is verse after, six. this is the time when the beast is not. Is not. Okay, right. Yes, yeah, so we've moved on. So well, that's we always understood that the beast was after seven United States. Eight deadly wounds. Okay. Okay, so Bonnie, can you, can you go on? Because I'm you, you, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so just in the past, the understanding was that that beast in the time of is not or um, yet uh, is not and yet is, is the United States. Well, no, is not and yet is, is the United States. Okay, no, well, we never but said the yet novel. is is the United States. No, that's not what we, I don't think we ever said the yet is, is the United States. That's the question right now. The yet is, is future. Because <clears throat> um, it was, mm -hmm. is not, and yet is, is actually the future. Mm -hmm. idea. That is, it's going to come into power again. So the woman is riding this beast. So the woman is the papacy, or, or is it not the papacy? Yeah, it's papacy. Okay. Church. Is, okay, is the beast the papacy? Mm. Well, she's controlling it. It is anyway. a kingdom. It is a kingdom. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. But, but this beast is of the seven. And that doesn't mean it's one of the seven. It's, it's, it's what's behind the that? seven. What's that? Yeah, it means it's one of the beasts that has been ridden in the past. Okay. Or it is, it is one of the seven. Okay, so um, if you look at Revelation, um, Revelation 13. So when it talks about the beast in Revelation 13, uh, the beast in Revelation 13, I'm just trying to see if I can find this. Um, I don't know if that's going to be. Okay, so here's what we normally refer to. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw the beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names, name of blasphemy. Now, we know this is papal Rome, right? Yeah. So what are the seven heads in Revelation 13? I don't know. Does Rome have seven divisions? I mean, does the papacy have seven divisions? Okay. Well, no. So, so we would just we would just generally say the seven heads are the same heads as in Revelation seventeen. Wouldn't we say that? Isn't that what we normally say? Yeah. Seven mountains. Okay. No, mountain well, head. So that's Revelation 17. Mountain so, head. so part of the thing that I'm trying to establish here is that we confound or conflate Revelation 12, 13, and 17. Right. And that we shouldn't be doing that. That they're talking right. about different, different things, even though yeah, they're using some of the same yeah. symbols. Yeah. You got to be separate. Yeah, you got to be separate. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. so, th so there's a distinction being made in the scriptures between these different beasts. But we know that they're using some of the same symbols or the same symbols, but they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're arranged differently. So, so we need to try to understand what's, what it is we're missing because I mean, I've studied these things for 40 years. And um, in that time, uh, you know, through most of that time, there was, there was no distinction made between the Beast of Revelation 13 and 17, even though they're different, and even the Beast of Revelation 12. So we just assume the heads are the same heads and that the horns are the same horns. But they can't be. Yeah, I've, I've never heard that distinction within Adventism. Yeah, okay. And, and it's just like when we look at the 1260 or the three times, times and a half in Daniel 12, and we every time we see times, times and a half, it must be the 1260 of papal, even though Daniel 127 is not referring to that period. It's referring to the first half of the 2520 for Northern Israel. Or another example is when we read 70 years, um, in Jeremiah, we think that those 70 years must be the same period of time, but they're not. Or the 70 years in Zechariah, we think it's the same period. So our brain just sees 70 years and we just put it in the same period of time. We do the same with this, these beasts. We just say they're the same. But we know on the 1843 chart, the beast of Revelation, um, 12 is pagan Rome and the beast of Revelation 13 is papal Rome. So why would we have the heads refer to the same, the same thing? Now, going back to Revelation 12. So I'm going to give you another option with the heads. 
could the heads be referring to seven kingdoms that end with Rome? That is, and this just came into my mind. So does anybody know of an interpretation where you're going to have the seven heads being um, Egypt, Assyria, et cetera? Anybody familiar with that idea? You say you meant uh, seven kings that support the papacy, they're behind the papacy? Okay, so so if we're going at Revelation 13, yeah, so they, they could be seven popes. That That's actually the explanation we looked at last week, that the seven heads are seven popes. That seems more likely, though, at this point. Yeah, and, and it's going to be popes, though, that if you're looking at Papal Rome, how would you apply the seven heads to, to Papal Rome if you're putting it in 1798? So so, so that, these are the problems we're facing. I know there, there's a lot of information here, but I'm, I'm trying to lay a foundation for what we're going to do next week more than anything. So we look at Revelation 12. Um, what, what are the options if we take these as kingdoms? So instead of taking them as starting with Babylon, could we take Revelation 17 and start somewhere else? Or Revelation 12, pardon me, and start somewhere else, else with the seven heads? I mean, some of you may be familiar with the, the hymn where it talks about Assyria ruling the world and et cetera. Anybody got an idea? Do you understand what I'm asking? If we were going to take these as being nations, what nations would we mark as pagan nations? Are there seven of them that lead up to Rome, including Rome? Theodore, are you talking about leading up to Rome as in in sacred history time? Yeah. Or sacred history. Okay. Right. Uh, so I don't know. I'm presuming you already know the answer to this. <clears throat> so is it in the Bible? Well, what are the nations in the Bible that are the pagan nations? Are there seven of them? That, that's starting with Assyria. You mean Assyria, Babylon? Okay. Well, okay. Would we could start before Assyria? We could start with the Tower of Babel. That's that's the old Babylonian Empire. And then you could have Assyria. You could have Egypt. And then the Neo Babylonian Empire. And then the Medo Persian Empire. And then Greece, and then Rome. Could you do that? Is the Neo, is that Neo Babylonian Empire in the Bible? Yeah, that's Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian Empire. Yeah. Okay. Right. But Babel is so but then it's prior to that. Yeah, Babel, Assyria, and then Babylon. Babylon was then that Egypt, not then Nebuchadnezzar. Egypt. Then you would have Egypt. Yeah. And then Nebuchadnezzar's empire, Babylon, the Neo-Babylonian empire. And then oh, you so have you're separating Persian Babylon Persian. from Neo-Babylon. Yeah. And I'm asking, is Babylon okay? So, I'm. I guess I'm. I'm drawing a blank. I'm trying to think of where where is that original Babylonian empire in the Bible? Then. That's that's Babel, the Tower of Babel. Well, you've already said that. You said Babel, then you said 
Yeah, Assyria. they are Assyria, Egypt, Babylon. Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Then then oh, Media Persia, okay. then Greece and Rome. That's seven of them. Okay. 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 So that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just putting that out there. Now, the Millerites said that the seven heads were the seven different forms of government. What is it that they had? Um, I'm just going to look this up again. Um, so when they deal with Revelation 10, they're going, or Revelation 12, pardon me, and they're going to look at the, the 10, the 10 horns, uh, and the seven heads. Uh, so let me see this here. Um, it's Haskell. So William Miller. Uh, he's going to deal with, I need Revelation 12 though. That's where my mistake was. <clears throat> okay. Sorry about this. I had this statement before. Okay. But the view that the seven heads of the dragon of 12 represent seven forms of government that were developed in the Roman Empire alone is not called in question. So this is Uriah Smith. So he's actually referring back to the view of the pioneers. It says your screen sharing is paused. I'm not sure why. Oh, I don't know why. New share. Here we go. How's that? Okay. <clears throat> and I'm gonna blow this up. Uh, I'm just gonna find this here. Um, you go back. So they say that they were seven forms of government. Um, I'm going to have to try to find the statement. Okay, well, I'm just going to address this here. I know this isn't the best. So Okay, so here's Uriah Smith writing about what the pioneers believed, and he's dealing with the seven heads of Revelation 12, 13, and 17. In advocating the view that the seven heads um, of the dragon of Revelation 12 and the beasts of Revelation 13 and 17 represent seven forms of government that have existed in the Roman Empire, the writer deems it necessary to remind the reader that he is not dealing in novelties. He is not introducing a new view to appeal to the curiosity of the reader and to cater to the not always healthy excitement of pursuing a line of thought because it is strange. But the view which will be advocated in this paper is one that ha which has characterized the Adventist movement from the beginning through the first, second, and third, age, third messages to the present time and is only beginning within a few years to be called in question. Nor can the view be said to be peculiar to Adventists in its historical aspect, a scheme devised by them to meet their peculiar views of prophecy. For scholars declared before the Adventist movement began that Rome had presented to the world as a unique and marvelous feature of history, seven distinct forms of government. All, of the, all that the Adventists did was to say, as the most natural thing in the world, that if Rome did have seven forms of government, the seven heads of the dragon, which was a symbol of Rome, must be designed to represent that fact. The old Roman historians Livy and Tacitus, Tacitus all acknowledged the different forms of government in Rome to be so many heads of the Roman Commonwealth and expressly named these four forms, kings, consuls, dictators, and decemvirs. And one of the earliest Protestant commentators Osiander, as early as 1511, names the whole seven 
as we have them, namely kings, consuls, decemvirs, decemvirs, anyway, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, dictators, triumvirs, emperors, and popes as the form of forms of Roman government represented by the seven heads in the dragon of Revelation 12 and the seven-headed beasts of Revelation 13 and 17. Adventists under the first message at once adopted this view. So this would be the view that the Millerites had, that the seven heads didn't represent seven kingdoms, but they represented seven forms of government. It may be said that this is going too far back for light and prophetic instruction, but we trust it will not be assumed that there have been no scholars who have been able to interpret history aright till within the last decade, or that none of the prophetic applications made by the men who lived in that era when the seal was broken from the book and who were impelled by the Spirit of God to prophetic study were entitled to any respect. But the view that the seven heads of the dragon of Revelation 12 represent seven forms of government that were developed in the Roman Empire alone is now called in question, whether with good reason or not. It is the purpose of this paper to try to determine the new views which are now brought forth to take the place of the old vary with every different exponent that is the person who's, who's teaching it, but it will be necessary to notice only those to which most prominence has been given. But before this is done, a few words must be offered to show what the dragon itself signifies. For, strange to say, it is also denied that this is a symbol of pagan Rome. It has always been thought to be an easy task to demonstrate that pagan Roman power in its first religious form is what is set forth under the symbol of the great dragon of Revelation 12. Symbols are applied in accordance with the position in which they are placed and the work which they are said to perform. In the present case, the dragon certainly represents that human government which attempted to destroy the Lord Jesus when he came into this world, and there can be no dispute that the power was Rome. But does it not say in verse 9 that the great dragon is the old serpent, the devil, and Satan? Very true. But it does not say that the great red dragon spoken of before was the devil and Satan. But it does, yeah, okay, so... Um, I lost where I was reading. But it does not say that the great red dragon spoken of before was the devil and Satan. Mark how carefully the prophecy distinguishes between these two symbols. One is a great red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and a tail that sweeps a third part of the stars of heaven from their orbit and casts them to the earth. Surely such a description cannot be made to apply to Satan as a person. Such an application would be more grotesque than the burlesques of Satan, born in the envenomed and hostile mind of skeptics and scoffers, wherein he is shown with cloven foot, bat's wings, cattle horns, and dart-pointed tail. The other is a reference to Satan personally, and the explanation is immediately added, stating that by this dragon, Satan is meant. Now, we know that Ellen White says that the dragon primarily represents Satan but it also represents pagan Rome. So, um, so the question here then, um, and he's gonna go on to say, how particular the angel is here to define the term dragon so that no mistake can be made. There's no need of confounding the two description. The dragon by which the devil personally is represented is not the, a great red dragon, is not a dragon with seven crowned heads, nor one with 10 horns and a tail. This dragon is a symbol of Rome, while the religion of the empire was pagan. In the Great Controversy, Mrs. White, we find um, uh, by Mrs. E.G. White, page 138, we find the following on this point. The dragon is said to be Satan. He it was that moved upon Herod to put the Savior to death, but the chief agent of Satan in making war upon Christ and his people during the first centuries of the Christian era was the Roman Empire, in which paganism was the prevailing religion. Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is, in a secondary sense, a symbol of pagan Rome. This is the only reasonable, as Uriah Smith goes on to say, and scriptural view to take of this matter. And how may we know when a dragon is thus used in a secondary sense, applying to some earthly power? It is when some specific features are ascribed to it, as multiple, multiplied heads, horns, etc., for a dragon, unqualified, has no such peculiar features, but is simply a hideous creature, conforming to what we see in nature. 
So when it is applied to Satan personally, it is explained as applying to him. And none of these features appear, but an additional phrase, that old serpent, is added to guard us further upon this point. Therefore, when such features as heads and horns are noted, as in Revelation 12, 3, we may know it is used in its secondary sense and applies to an earthly government, that earthly government being, in this case, his chief agent, pagan Rome. So in Ezekiel 29, 3, Egypt, when a prominent agent of Satan, is symbolized by a great dragon. But there it, there it is represented as a river monster having scales. It is certainly bad enough to, for unbelievers and worldlings to characterize, caricature the devil as having two horns and a tail. How much worse it is for Bible students to emphasize that caricature by giving him seven heads and ten horns, as well as the inevitable tail. So you can see his argument here is that when we're looking at the, the dragon of Revelation 12, it's pagan Rome, and that these heads and horns and all these features are symbols that need to be understood as applying to pagan Rome. So the idea that he's presenting here is the Millerite idea, that the seven heads represent seven forms of government. Now, he's going to go on here, so let's look at what he says about uh, the, how people will interpret these things. John had the vision of Revelation in AD 96, and here it is shown a symbol of the government under which he lived and was suffering persecution. And that symbol was a great red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns. Then all the features which appear in the dragon we should expect to find, should we not, in some features or characteristics of the Roman Empire. This would certainly seem to be most natural, but the new view is a departure from this natural method. According to this view, contrary to all precedent, the scope of this vision was retroactive, going back not merely to the beginning of history and then current government, but a way outside of its limits to take in the great governments of the earth, which have been already symbolized in prophecy, some of them three times over, and which had passed away centuries before, never again to peer or to have any influence among men. Such kingdoms as these, it is contended, are included among the heads of the dragon, the new enumeration being given as follows, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome pagan, Rome papal, United Italy, a future head yet unknown, and then the eighth, the papacy restored. So in, and this is, I'm not sure when this was written, but it's in the time of Uriah Smith. So he died in 1903. So this is probably much, much earlier. Um, but this would be the view that we have now. Now, could we take, when we look at Revelation 13, do we have reason to attach to the heads Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, etc.? And what would be the reason that we would do that? In Revelation 13. Because the books of Revelation and Daniel are one book. Okay. But we would look at the beast in Revelation 13. Doesn't it have the characteristics of Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome? Very much so. Okay. So, so there's reasons why. We would then say that they, they are, these heads represent those kingdoms. But in Revelation 12, see, what I'm doing is I, I, I'm going to try to understand this, that, that there, we're going to look at the different options. So we're going to be open-minded. Now, Uriah Smith is arguing that in Revelation 12, you shouldn't be able to have the heads there represent successive kingdoms. Now, what would be the argument that we could attach these kingdoms to pagan Rome? What would be the argument for doing so? The argument might be that they, they typify the different types of government, the seven forms of government that we were talking about earlier. Okay, 
but that would be not not kingdom. So we're going to look at these and we're going to try to understand the arguments. We're not we're not necessarily saying that we, we we're settled on these things yet. But the seven forms of government, the argument that he's making is the Millerite argument. That is the beast in Revelation 12 represents pagan Rome at the time of Christ going up until um, the end of pagan Rome, which is ultimately going to be when papal Rome arises. But we know that there's this new view that you rise. Okay, so then what about yeah. what? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the new view. Then the, the the seven forms of government. No, that's the old view. That's that's the Millerite view. Okay, then what's the that's the what? The new view is the one that it represents nations progressively. So, what would be the okay. argument for taking Revelation twelve? And doing, as I said, Babel, which is the first empire, the beginning of kingdoms, right? That's that's when we have kingdoms. And then, um, uh, and, and whether you're going to put Egypt or Assyria next, I, I, it would depend, I guess, when they come in, into a history. So you'd probably put Egypt after Babel and then Assyria. And then the Neo Babylonian Empire, and then Medo Persia, Greece, and then Rome. And and the reason for doing that, what would be a good reason for doing that in Revelation twelve? Because you're doing it with Revelation thirteen. Okay. So because we're doing it with the Revelation 13, but Revelation 13, we would start at Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan Rome, papal, and they have United Italy, which we would say the sixth is actually the United States, if you take what Ellen White says. Um, and then um, the seventh is going to be the Ten Kings with the papacy behind it all, right? That's our view. So he's, he's mentioning a view that's a new view then, which basically took over in Adventism to some degree, right? I mean, that's what I would have been taught, something similar to this when I became an Adventist. I would know this, the kingdoms. I would not have heard about the heads. So the argument then is, since it's done in Revelation 13, we should be able to do it in Revelation 12. Now, Uriah Smith is arguing that we can't do it at all. But we know that five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come in Revelation 17. And, and that's hard to apply that to the seven forms of government, especially when you're dealing with modern Rome. So Uri Smith has a different understanding of this. Um, but could we say that pagan Rome is just a continuation of paganism? The reason that you have these seven heads as these successive kingdoms is because Rome is a pagan nation. It has the characteristics of these past powers. Rome is not really some new power. It's taken on this, this, this characteristic that's been passed down all the way from Babel. That would be an argument, would it not? Yeah, it changes, yeah. Okay. I'm not really, I'm not following. Well, if, if Rome is pagan Rome, the, and on these heads are successive nations that lead up to pagan Rome, pagan Rome didn't just come out of nowhere. It's a continuation of something that started in Babel. Yeah, no, I get that part. Yeah, so, so that, that would be the argument that I would use if I'm going to take the seven heads as being seven six successive nations. Now, we have that there's seven forms of government. Another interpretation is that the seven heads represent seven emperors. So this would take it more 
uh, apply it to pagan Rome at that time in this line that we're doing. So we know there's this Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome interpretation. We know that there's this interpretation of the seven forms of government. But can we apply the seven heads to seven individuals, to seven Roman emperors, is the question now. So we're looking at all of them, and we're trying to weigh the merits of these different views. So, sorry, there's some confusion okay. about, in my mind, about um, looking at the riddle uh, that the eighth is of the seven. We're talking about seven forms of government, which to which that riddle does not necessarily apply. And yet we are looking at the kingdoms of the earth to which that riddle does apply. Okay. So the problem there would be if we take Revelation 17 and we try to apply the riddle to Revelation 12 and Revelation 13, can we do that? And I would say yeah. that we can't. That, that that riddle applies to Revelation 17, not to Revelation 13 and not to Revelation 12. Yeah, that would seem so. Okay. But then when we're talking about the seven heads, we're not talking about, it's the seven heads of one beast, one entity. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it's not seven successive different entities. So this study uh, that we're just reading here by Uriah Smith was published in 1896 um, and was published by Smith um, himself, and it was offered on a limited basis. So it wasn't a really popular study, I guess. Um, it's probably a bit controversial, maybe. I don't know. But yeah, so what we have here is... We have taken Revelation 12, 13, and 17, and basically taken the beast as somewhat the same. We might make a little bit of a distinction regarding the beast of Revelation 12, um, but we're going to take the 10 toes and the 10 horns, and, and we're going to go back to Daniel 7, and we're just going to say the 10 represents divided Europe. We're not going to they're not going to take the 10 horns in Revelation 17 and apply that to the United Nations, right? At least not in the way that we do. They're going to say it's United Europe or Italy, as he calls it here. That somehow Europe needs to be united again. That's, that's the sixth head, mm -hmm. which, which really doesn't make much sense. But... But anyway, the different views were circulating at this time. And Uriah Smith's trying to say, well, these are pretty speculative. We need to go back to what the pioneers said. I'm taking the view that we don't fully understand these, vi these uh, beasts. We don't fully understand these visions, that we've we brought assumptions into our discussion. And, and we have to establish, are those assumptions valid? <laughs> well, now, one of the things that you said before, Theodore, was yeah. the seven forms of government, like the triumvirs and the decemvirs yeah. mm -hmm. and kings and, and popes and all that. So is that a constant, not, not necessarily the names, but having different layers of authority? Because that is actually what we have today as well. And that seems to be a constant, like all these seven heads that seem to be a constant. Uh, I'm just trying, anyways, if they are a constant, like all the way back to pagan Rome days, chapter 12, mm -hmm. doesn't it establish then the, the lines of authority with the different levels of authority that this beast has as a characteristic? Well, it's definitely not constant. So that's one thing when you look at this and and I look at the number seven as sort of arbitrary, what they're going to choose as the forms of government. That would be the argument I have against it, is that it's fine to say somebody has said there's seven forms of government and they're going to list them off, but you're going to find different lists. So there isn't some 
solidified seven forms of government that we can look at. I agree. Okay. I agree, so, but maybe yeah. that's not the important point. Maybe the important point is that each of those, uh, um, uh, what are we talking about? The, the beasts of Revelation 12, 13, and 17, each of them has different levels of authority and seven different levels. Okay. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's a possibility. So we're not going to leave anything out, but we have three different interpretations or basic interpretations. The seven heads represent seven forms of government in some way. The seven heads represent seven individuals, or they represent the progressive nations that lead to that period of time. So those are the three basic interpretations of the seven heads. We also have the issue of the ten horns. So the ten horns, the horns represent kings. Or do they not? Or do they represent something else? Powers of some sort. So you've got seven heads and you've got ten horns. Could the ten horns represent individuals? Somebody said something? I, I think the, you mentioned it earlier that the, the number 10 is universalism, right? It, it kind of uh, brings in that factor, that characteristic. Yeah, so like an Universality. empire. Universality. Yeah, like an empire. Yeah, so, so in some way it represents an empire. But the thing is they're 10 horns. Now the horns don't have crowns though in Revelation 12. The heads have crowns. So, so you can see the problem. We have this problem. So what, where does the crown, what does the what crown that? symbolize? What's the well, symbolism of the crown? That means they have power, right? All right. There you go. There you go. So look at it from that perspective then. If in chapter 12, that beast had seven forms, seven levels of government authority, mm -hmm. and each of those levels has... Um, did they have crowns? No, they didn't have crowns in chapter 12, right? This chapter 12, the heads have the crowns. The heads have the crowns. Okay, so then we're looking at some sort of power, powerful authority. Right. Seven offices that actually do have power and authority. But then there's going to be 10 horns, right? So, so both of these, in a sense, they're kind of a similar symbol, heads and horns. But when we look at back in Daniel chapter uh, seven, you're gonna see that these horns exist. There's gonna be, um, and, and Daniel chapter eight as well, you're gonna have these, these beasts that have horns. And, and what are they representing? The horns, the, the horns on the beasts. In what chapter? Well, Daniel chapter 7 or Daniel chapter 8. I don't know. I think we're bringing too much into it because we're talking about those three books in, in Revelation, those three chapters. Yeah, well, but we know the that beast. the character... Like, if you're talking character, about horns, I think it's important. Sorry. Yeah. So in order to it's understand... Right. If, you, if you're Daniel talking about horns... It's, in order to understand Daniel chapter... Yeah, well, I'll come back to you here. I'm just going to answer your first point. So in order to understand Daniel chapter 12, 13, and 17, we have to go back, or Revelation 12, 13, and 17, we have to go back to the book of Daniel because it's going to give us these characteristics that are seen in this beast. That is, the beast of Revelation okay. 13 is the beasts of Daniel chapter 7. So that's one thing that, and, and he's going to talk about the horns. So we want to know what the symbol of the horns are. And... And then you're going to see this, this um, in Daniel 7, 7. And I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth and it devoured and break in pieces. It stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. And I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three three of the first horns plucked up by its roots. 
So here, what do the horns represent? Mm -hmm. Anybody, what do the horns represent? In the basic sense. Could I just make an offering? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I seem to be doing a lot of talking. Sorry about that. But um, I think it's important to always keep that because the horns are always numbered. So I think it's important to consider the characteristics that the number implies with the horns. And it seems like number 10 is a, one of the numbers that's fairly consistent, mm -hmm. which has a meaning. It has a characteristic, a meaning. Mm -hmm. And yeah, whether so a horn is the ge yeah, whether a horn is a geographical area or not, what does the number ten? I mean, the number. I think it's just important to always keep the number in view. Okay, right. Now we have in Daniel chapter eight, we're going to have some beasts with horns. We're going to have a ram that is two horns, Media and Persia. And so, what do the horns represent? Kingdoms. Kingdoms, right? That is the kingdoms of Media and Persia. And then Greece is going to have a horn. And what is the horn on the goat, which is Greece? What is that whole horn going to represent? The ruler Alexander. Alexander. So it's now going to represent an individual. Okay. And then there's going to be four horns, because that horn's going to be broken. And there's going to be four horns that come up, right? I think you can still make the argument that the horn still denotes a geographical area because Greece is one entity and Greece was divided into four geographical entities. But Alexander is not a, a geographical entity himself. No, but he was the, the ruler of one geographical entity, which was Greece. Yeah. But it's still, it's not talking about Greece per se. It's talking about Alexander in particular. And then, yeah. yeah. Okay, as a question based on the uh, sister's prior comment, mm -hmm. when was Greece ever divided into four geographic areas? The Greek empire, yes, but not Greece itself. Not Greece itself. So the empire is divided towards the four winds of heaven. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then you're going to have a little horn come up. So how many horns do we have in Daniel chapter 8? Eight. Four horns and isn't it four horns and then we have a fifth that comes up and we have the ram and Alexander So there's two horns on the ram. Correct. Alexander's horns. Right. And then you're going to have four more horns. And then you're going to have this little horn. Eight. So that's yeah. a total of eight, right? Yeah. So you have a total of eight, whatever that means. But you do have horns. And they don't always represent the same things. That is, they do represent a power, whether it's a kingdom or an individual. So in, in trying to understand Revelation chapter 12, these symbols of heads and horns, I don't think that we fully understand them yet. That is, we have taken applications of these prophecies that we've sort of inherited as Seventh-day Adventists that are generally there's something correct about what we're doing. But there's obviously some inconsistencies. And if we're going to follow Miller's rules, we have to let the Bible interpret itself and not bring into it speculations that are based on assumptions that may be true or may not be true. Now, 
we're going to close this study right away, but I, I just want to go back to what was originally on the screen when I started the study. And that is this diagram of these, these kings. So we looked at the study that Odilio had. So he's comparing, he's not taking the five or fallen one is and one is yet to come, at least not in an explicit manner. But he is comparing this to the kings, at least loosely, to how we apply uh, the presidents of the United States. Now, Nero would be, so you would say five are fallen, one is. Galba would be the one that is, and the one is yet to come. So he's lining this up as the seven thunders. But you could also line them up. We know that the study of the seven thunders in relationships to the kings of Persia, to the kings of Judah, uh, both the first and the last kings, the last kings of Israel, um, uh, the presidents of the United States, the first and the last presidents of the United States. We've taken these and we've lined them up and we've, we've put them together, but there's inconsistencies that we haven't addressed. And, and I think that we have to address those. That is, we have to be very clear what it is we're doing. Now, what I did on the top here is I lined up 10 emperors from Augustus to Titus. So in this scenario, we could look at the time of the end as being Augustus, right? So if we were going to line this up oops, with our history, we would put this as the time of the end. And then there's going to be three that rise up, Tiberius, Caligula, and Claudius. And then the fourth is going to be far richer than them all. That would be Nero, right? So Nero would represent Trump. And we can see in the history of Nero, these symbols that tie us to the July 18, 2020 prediction. And then Galba and what's happening here, that is, you're going to have four, four different emperors. And these would represent the history that we're now in. And in that history, you're going to have, uh, Vesp under Vespasian, you're going to have the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem. And then the 10th in this list would be Titus. And Titus is the one who brings about the destruction of Jerusalem. But he also later becomes an emperor. You know, roughly about nine years after he destroys Jerusalem. Now, another list would take, this would be more in line with what Odilia was doing. He's going to start with Julius as these these last seven or the first seven emperors now technically julius is not counted as an emperor does anybody know why that is why is augustus the first emperor they're both caesars so it's one thing we have to look into but you know, I spent some time looking into it myself, and I don't really have the answer to it. Some people will put Julius Caesar as the first emperor, but generally he's not considered an emperor. He's a dictator. He was selected as a dictator by the people. He was not an emperor. Right. So technically he would not be an emperor. But people just loosely, in a sort of a colloquial fashion, say that he's an emperor. Yeah, but that historically is not correct. Right. So Augustus is the first emperor. So in Odilia's study, he's putting Julius Caesar as the first emperor, even though he's not. Yeah, that's when when I saw you have that up, I shook my head because Julius was Julius Caesar was not an emperor. And it was a, a bit of time before Octavian became Augustus and became emperor. Right. So, and, and, and the reason, now, 
the thing is an emperor is somebody who's in charge of an empire. So I don't know the particular details, and maybe you know more about it, of it just has something to do with the origins of his reign. Of why we would put Augustus as the first emperor. Correct. Right? Yeah, but in a colloquial sense, we often think of Julius Caesar as the first emperor, but that's not technically correct. But, you know, you could still put Julius on the line, maybe, but if you're going to deal with the first seven emperors, it doesn't really make much sense if you're going to deal with the first seven emperors. You have to have some reason to start with Julius. I mean, you could say the first seven Caesars, you know, because they're going to all take the title of Caesar as such, but okay. And then you're going to have Nero. So, so we're going to look at this in a lot more detail now, but the point that I'm making here is that the 10 horns could represent 10 Kings, but the seven heads represent something about these Kings. Now, one of the things we see with, um, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius. Now, what, what is one of the characteristics that, that you need to become an emperor? There's two characteristics that you need. You need support from where? Like, how does somebody become an emperor that, you know, you could say, I'm the emperor, but how does it confirm that you're an emperor? Anybody know? To mo for most of the men that are in this list, these are what they would call the Julio-Claudio dynasty, right? Yeah. So would that not have been some type of a familial relationship? Okay. But see, they, they didn't believe that they had a monarchy. So even though there is this inheritance, uh, when it's in dispute, there's, there's a reason behind how you can become the emperor. So from what I could see that there are two different characteristics. You need the support of the military and you need the support of the Senate in some way. So, um, so the people, so you have to have some kind of popular support and also the support of the military. And I had this lined up and I ended up closing it. So I'm going to try to find it again. Okay, so it says here, the legitimacy of an emperor's rule depended on his control of the army and the recognition by the Senate. An emperor would normally be proclaimed by his troops or invested with imperial titles by the Senate or both. The first emperors reigned alone. Later emperors would sometimes rule with co-emperors and divide administration and empire between them. So one of the things we see with some of these people on this list is they didn't really have control of the military. The reason why there's this year of the four emperors, Galba, Otho, Vitellius, and Vespasian, is that they could not maintain power, especially these three, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius, they could not maintain power because the military was divided. And, and that's why they had these short reigns. Vespasian finally resolves that and manages, manages to reign uh, for 10 years from July of 69 to June of 79. So, so I'm arguing that you could, and this is just a suggestion, that the seven heads could represent Julius, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero, and Vespasian, but the ten horns represent all of these ten kings, including Galba, Otho, and Vitellius. That's one suggestion. I'm not saying it's a good one, but I'm saying it, it's 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 a possibility. Now. I thank everybody for, for sitting through this study, which is not giving us a lot of answers. But what we are doing is we're asking questions. 
what is the basis for what we understand about these beasts? And could we apply that riddle to this history? And if we did, if we tried to say five are fallen, one in is and one yet one is yet to come, when he continues, he must continue a short space. And then the eighth, he is even of the seven, and he's gonna then, you know, like, like you understand what I'm saying. So if we're gonna apply that to Revelation 13 and we're gonna apply it other places. The question is, is there grounds for doing so? Is there grounds for, I mean, we, we saw amazing coincidences in Odilio's study that show the significance of Nero. But then can we say Nero represents Trump? That, that's the question. And, and are we doing this correctly when we um, apply the seven thunder, so to speak, to these to these kings. So I, I, I've left you with a lot of questions. And what I expect as homework is people are going to spend time thinking about this and studying this. And of course, the people on YouTube as well. And, and maybe Uriah Smith is correct that the pioneer view is what we should understand or some something close to the pioneer view with additional light that an understanding that we have now and that when we're going to take the nations um the five are fallen one is um which is revelation 17 is that going to be babylon media persia greece and rome i mean that's the way we've taken it i would think it's correct but we can see that that's that revelation 17 is is modern rome it's definitely not referring to the to the beast of Revelation 13. That is, you can't take the beast of Revelation 13 and just say it's the same beast. And then we have these problems in Revelation 17 about the beast is the eighth. And it's of the seven, which we've interpreted as one of the heads. But is that a correct interpretation? So so you see the problems, hopefully. Um, and I'm not meaning to cause confusion or just disturb people's understanding, but I think that we need to study this more closely. And that's what we're trying to do on Friday nights. Any final thoughts on this study before we close with prayer? Now, I know we had a lot more people when we started this study, so hopefully I didn't bore them, but I, I think some people just have things to do. Um, is this study something we should be doing, in people's opinion? Yes. Okay. And, and sometimes when we do a study, like we've learned a lot of things um, and unlearned a lot of things. But I, I think Uriah Smith, even though I don't always agree with him, he has a strong point when he says the pioneers believed something and we've sort of cast it off and accepted something new. And and the question is, I'm not saying that Uriah Smith is correct, because I don't know if you can apply that then to Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. But definitely with Revelation 12, we have to be careful on how we're understanding this. We just have assumed that this has always been what Adventists have understood. But that's not the case. And we've learned a lot by going back to Millerite history. And maybe there's things we're going to see as we do that. So I'm going to try to get this, because um, we're still going to look at Adilio's study uh, again. Next week, we're going to look at some other aspects of it. And we're going to try to find Tabo's study. If somebody has the study of Tabo's, on uh, the first seven emperors, um, if they could get me a copy. I'm still, I know it's on my computer, I just can't find it. Um, because I do wanna look at that as well. 
and, and see what they say and what blessing says. Okay. Well, let's close with the word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath. And we're thankful for the, the people who have been a part of this study and who are watching this video. We know, Lord, that this is not an easy topic. But we ask that your Holy Spirit, and we know that your Holy Spirit can teach us. So we ask for its instruction in our personal study as we contemplate these things. We know events are happening around us in the world, and we want to understand them correctly. So we ask for your guidance. We're thankful, Lord, that we can have these studies, uh, that we can share with one another. And we know, Lord, that these are given not for just intellectual understanding, but that we may receive a conviction that you have been leading us and that we can also see our sin and forsake it and that you can strengthen us spiritually. I pray again for each person. May you be with them in their particular needs. May your angels watch over them. And may we all listen to your Holy Spirit speaking to us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. And we pray for a blessing upon this Sabbath and the time that we have together tomorrow. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.